Hi, I'm Jordan. I'm a U of T PA grad currently working at SickKids in the Department of Emergency Medicine. I'm one of the PAs at SickKids in Toronto, so I work in the pediatric emergency room. I graduated from U of T in 2015, I think, so still pretty new at the job, but loving every minute of it. Prior to being a PA, I did patient transfers and I attended Western University in London doing a bachelor. Yeah, so in undergrad, I focus in general medical sciences and kind of had a special interest in public health and immunology. And then for my um, experience prior to PA school, I did patient transfers through non-urgent transfer companies as well as a first responder. So a lot of sporting events, a lot of concerts. Um, actually, one of the companies I worked at specialized in equine sports, so a lot of horseback riding, injuries, and things like that. And how did you get the qualifications to be able to do that job? So I started as a volunteer at St. John Ambulance. So they were great. They kind of give you the training. They are they're free for the volunteers, so they train you up. They have lots of instructors who are also in healthcare, so I had nurses and doctors who kind of give you that first responder training. And then after the first responder training, uh, they kind of set you loose and you're able to really get some hands-on experience with patients in a very autonomous position considering what you're actually doing. And they still have lots of supports available and yeah. How did you decide on becoming a PA? I actually learned about PA in one of my public health classes. So it was my health management systems class or some, something like that. Um, and we were learning about kind of the problems with the healthcare system and potential solutions. And it was actually PAs came up as one of the potential solutions for the prolonged wait times, for the expense, um, for the dealing with the aging population issue. I found it super interesting. When I looked into it, actually my family doctor had a PA at the time. Um, and I was able to shadow the PA at my family doctor's office and I loved what he did. Um, and the more I looked into it, I took the chance and I applied to U of T right out of undergrad and I was able to get him because of some of that experience that I had working as a first responder. So everything kind of just aligned really well for me to end up in the PA profession. I love every minute of it since then. Mm -hmm. And were there other careers that you were contemplating at the time? I was really thinking about paramedicine. Um, my dad's a paramedic. and. Coming from that first responder background, I really loved that pre-hospital setting. I loved the adrenaline rush. I loved the acuity of what I was seeing. Um, but I also saw how that was a hard profession for my dad, how it had taken a toll on his body, how it, um, he kind of reached a peak at the age of 50 where he wasn't advancing any further in the profession. Um, and I wanted something that I could continue to grow and also something that had some mobility. So when I was looking to settle down, when I was looking to retire, I could move into something of that field. How did you enjoy PA school? I loved it. It's, it's a whirlwind, um, for sure. It's as intense as everybody thinks it is. Um, so two years, the six semester program with very little break. My northern rotations at U of T, so U of T does the one year of didactic learning and then one year of rotations. So we rotate through two family medicine, eMERGE, pediatrics, general surgery, psychiatry, um, women's health, internal medicine, and then two electives, a couple 10. Um, and we do half of those rotations up north. So that northern placement really, I think, changed how I practice and how I see patients, especially when they're coming from some lower SES, social economic status um, perspectives, because you see a lot of that up north. I met some of my best friends in PA school and we've remained close now, even graduating, even though we're in different fields, we still talk and we still have that camaraderie, yeah. Um, so PA school was fantastic for me, it was everything I hoped. And where did you choose to do your elective rotations in? Um, so I did my first elective rotation in the ICU at Brampton. Really cool experience, so Brampton is not a big teaching hospital, so it meant that I got a lot of hands-on time with patients. I got to do a lot of procedures that I think otherwise I wouldn't have at a more of a major teaching hospital. And the doctors there were really eager to teach and to show a PA student. A lot of the doctors in intensive care have actually worked or trained partially in the States. So those doctors that have trained in the States, they're really used to PAs and they kind of miss their role when they move to Canada. Um, so the fact that they had a PA student they thought was amazing and they really took me on. And my second elective was actually in the Emerge at Sick Kids where I ended up working. Um, obviously I loved it, I'm a little bit biased, um, but again, this was a little bit different because it's a big academic teaching hospital. 
the docs have so much experience in teaching. And again, a lot of them came from the United States and they missed that PA role. So I love the patients. Like, I, I fell in love with pediatrics. I, I knew I wanted to work with kids, but I didn't realize that I could make a career out of it until kind of that point in my, in my training. So um, yeah, that's where I did my rotations. How did, uh, how did you go about finding your position after graduation? So I was lucky. I'm one of the few that uh, their elective rotation, my final rotation, was right before the Career Start grant. Um, and I loved it. So when the Career Start grant came out, SickKids was listed on it. Um, I sent in my application. And I, I managed to get an interview. Hopefully, they, I guess they liked what they saw when I was in clerkship. It was, I was also kind of lucky because it was the only place I actually interviewed for. They put the process out really early. They were one of the first in the Career Start grant. And I actually knew I had a job before I wrote the exam. So I was very lucky that kind of, again, the stars somehow managed to align for me. And yeah, they happened to be looking for a PA when I was looking for a job. How would you describe or define pediatric emergency medicine? Hmm. So in Peds Emerge, we see anybody under the age of 18. So right from birth, like um, difficult labor and birth at, from a midwife at home, all the way up to their 17th and 364th day on this planet. And we will see everybody for any complaint. So we're very much the safety net. Um, everything ranging from the sniffles to abdominal pain to kids who have been hit by a car. Um, so we'll see anything that comes in our door. A lot of the times, because we are that tertiary care center, we are considered the expert location, we'll get a lot of parents and families who are frustrated, um, and they come to us for answers because they've had a hard time or lack of resources. Um, so we see those patients that sometimes other doctors need extra help on and they refer into us. We see those patients who sometimes think that they weren't getting enough care in other locations. And we'll see those patients who are really close to us. Sometimes they just need kind of that reassurance, um, but oftentimes they do need a lot of interventions, whether that's IV fluids and antibiotics, whether it's setting a broken bone, or whether it's advanced imaging, CT scans, and ultrasounds. Um, so everything and anything under the age of 18 is a fair game for us. Mm -hmm. And how is the patient population different than treating adults? So, so generally they're, they're healthier. Um, obviously the more you age, the more comorbidities you're going to have. So the more you age, the more illnesses and drugs you accumulate as you move through life. That being said, we do see actually a fair number of complex children and they tend to be sicker and they have a lot of more things like genetic disorders and metabolic disorders. These are the kids that sometimes don't make it all the way to adulthood, um, so we, we see them as well. There's different pathologies that occur in children than adults. So when a child falls, I was just telling my colleagues that if they fall, they're going to break their elbow. They're going to get a supracondylar fracture, and that's what happens to a kid. Not the same for an adult. So they get hurt in different ways. They get different kinds of conditions, and they present differently as well. Um, the case we often cite is appendicitis. So everybody knows appendicitis is this kind of abdominal pain and fevers and vomiting. And that might just not be true in the three-year-old kind of that toddler group. They will sometimes just have very vague complaints. So even when we get the same things as adults, sometimes they just present a little bit differently. Can you describe the practice setting or department? Are there different areas? How many PAs, et cetera? So there's four areas in the emergency, there's four areas in the emergency department. Um, we have our east and west area, so those are our higher acuity areas. Ideally, east is supposed to be for more kind of those complex chronic patients, um, and west is for the ultra high acuity patients, though that doesn't always happen, and sometimes we have to flow them from one to the other. We also have our trauma resuscitation area in the emergency department, which houses up to four patients. Um, hopefully we never have to reach that, but it's happened with big accidents and bus rollovers and other things. And then we also have kind of our urgent care area where we see some of the lower acuity patients. That being said, a lot of the times our lower acuity patients come in because we see so many patients. We have such a high volume of patients. One out of every so many patients in that low acuity area is actually going to have something that's kind of sinister and sneaky and is actually very urgent and needs some emergency intervention. In the eMERGE, we have six PAs, so I was actually the second cohort of PAs to be hired. So I was really fortunate that I had an amazing group, Julia and Claire, who came in right before me and they really helped establish the PA role in the department, establish directives for us as well. Um, then there was my cohort, so Emma and myself, and then we just hired two more PAs in the last year, so Brayden and Elise. We work mostly during the peak hours that patients come in. So the morning and the after school evening hours. We work 
both weekends, evenings, and holidays because the emergency room never quits. Um, occasionally we'll have to do an overnight shift, but those are thankfully quite rare for us, and we average about one overnight shift, one or two overnights per month. And do PAs uh, spend time in all of the areas, or are you more focused on... Uh, one or the other? Yeah. yeah, so we spend about 75% of our time, I would say, in the urgent care side and probably 25 then in the more emergent side. It's just a matter of where our patient volumes are. So one of the roles of the PA in our department is to be flexible and to keep an eye on where the wait times are for patients. Sometimes, be just because of one thing after the other, they have to always see the, the most acute patient first. You'll end up with patients waiting who are still emergent and on the high acuity side, but they've been there for several hours, so then they might move us over to see those patients as well. And um, can you just give us a list or a sample of some of the common conditions that you see in the ER, PCR? So tons, tons and tons of upper respiratory tract inf infections. Please get your flu shot. <laughs> my, my free plug. Um, abdominal pain and constipation, appendicitis, common fractures like your supracondylar fracture, your clavicular fractures. Um, those are really kind of our bread and butter type of things, along with stomach flu and every, every other type of viral illness under the sun. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the rare conditions that you've seen come through? So again, because we're a tertiary care center, we see a lot of rare conditions. Um, some of the better known rare conditions, things like cystic fibrosis, which is still actually an ultra rare disease when you look at the actual incidence in the population. Um, but other things like moya moya and um, genetic disorders that aren't even listed on up to date yet. We see a ton of different presentations and different levels of prevalence. And what are some procedures that you perform autonomously as a PA? So autonomously, we will perform laceration repairs. We do a lot of laceration repairs um, in the emergency room. We'll also do foreign body retrievals. So kids love sticking things in their nose and their ears, and we're the ones that will help get that out. We'll also do some like nursemaid elbows and other simple relocations like that. Because they're kids, we're a little bit sensitive about a lot of our kids need some eggs anxiolysis for that, and because of the PA scope, we're not able to order medications like midazolam um, and fentanyl, which we use routinely for procedures. So when those medications are involved, we have to have a physician involved as well. Casting and splinting. Um, we're really lucky that our nurses probably do a lot of our casting. We do some of the circumferential casts. So we don't do a lot of slabs, but um, we'll do circumferential casts um, if the need arises, and we'll also do cast removal and other things like that. And are you prescribing medications or initiating management in the ER as well? Yeah, so we got medical directives about a year and a half ago now, um, and they're, they're quite broad, so fluids, antibiotics, um, blood work, x-rays, ultrasounds, so all of that's kind of within our scope, and we'll start the management, especially if it's something that we're very familiar with, kind of autonomously, and then after some of those results start to come back, we'll review with our physician in more detail. Mm -hmm. So you had a mini orientation to the PCR because you did clerkship, mm -hmm. and then it was right into the job. Yeah. Um, but for a brand new hire to the PCR like you've had for the two new ones, mm -hmm. what does orientation look like for them? So our orientation at the PEDS Emerge is actually lasts for about a month. Um, so they get the normal HR, what to do in the case of a fire, what, like, this is how you find your pay stub, and then we pair up one of the new higher PAs with one of the senior PAs. So they do a little bit of shadowing for about the first week or so, and then the senior PA starts to act as kind of a preceptor. So going in and reviewing some of the patients, talking about some of the learning points with them. Um, we also have tons and tons of resources that the hospital provides us, both like written material like textbooks and Canadian Pediatric Society guidelines, as well as actual hands-on didactic sessions. So um, we get our advanced pediatric life support class taken care of, we get um, hands-on teaching for ultrasound with our POCUS fellows, so lots of different things that kind of, they work really well with us both from the physician side and the senior PA side in order to help us succeed in our role. What can a patient expect if being seen by a PA? When a patient sees me, they can expect to get a history and physical exam started. Um, so I will go in, I introduce myself in my role as a PA. And then we take the history, we'll, we'll perform the physical exam, and then depending on the complaint, I usually start some kind of investigation. So that might be, I explained that I think the patient needs a catheter because they are three months old and I'm worried about a UTI and they're not able to pee for us yet. It might be a chest x-ray or an ultrasound or something else like that, and it might be blood work. I explain kind of the role of the investigation and the rationale behind it.
we will get that going if there's anything to treat so a laceration i will start the management for, and for us that means some um, topical analgesics for the patient they can ex depending on the complaint they can expect me to get pretty far before i start to involve my supervising physician so obviously if the child looks unwell or if it's a complex complaint or something i haven't came across before then i get the physician involved early and they'll come in they'll introduce themselves and how we work as a team and they'll help me and guide me through the management of my patients. If it's something that I've seen before and I'm comfortable managing, they might see my supervising physician at the end of kind of our meeting before discharge to ensure that one, I didn't miss anything and that this child does look well and to answer any questions that the parent might have about the care of their child. Um, so we, we very much work as a team and hand, hand off very closely to each other. Um, but it kind of depends on what the patient's actually coming in for as to what they can expect when they see me. And do some counseling and answer questions for the parents. Excellent. And um, what was I going to ask? Mm -hmm. Sort of to talk about the impact of having PAs working in PZR. So one of the big impacts that I think the PA group has had is really standardization of practice. Um, so it's a big department. I think there's close to 50 supervising physicians actually signed on to my directives. Some of them work a lot. Some of them might only work once a month or once every other month. So just having that variation in practice, and obviously everybody practices a little different. Medicine's not an algorithm, it is an art. Um, but having the PAs there to standardize how we diagnose UTIs, how we interpret ECGs, how we call x-rays and recall families for positive blood cultures. Having the PAs there for that kind of role has really helped um, patient flow, I think. We've also allowed our doctors to shift their focus to some of our more acute patients. So they, they come in for all of our patients, but to have their ability to have that cognitive space freed up for those acutely ill patients, those complex need patients, I think that's been a big benefit to them as well as to the patients themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, would you say your role is fairly similar to a resident or a fellow, or are there some differences? There's definitely some differences. Like, we're, we're lifetime learners, but we're not there in the department to actively learn. Um, we're, we're there to work. So I think in a lot of the ways we, we act in a very similar fashion, but I'm also always happy to take a resident on and show them the technique that we use for hair approximation of a laceration repair. Um, so the way we go about our work is different even if the end outcome is somewhat the same. Mm -hmm. And what do you enjoy about PZR? I love the kids. Um, I don't think I can go back to adult medicine. I think they, I think they sold me on pediatrics. Um, the, the kids are amazing. Like they're so resilient and so brave, especially the ones that have these chronic medical needs and they're really familiar with the, the healthcare system. From such a young age, you see that resilience and that kind of determination in them. Um, and then the staff, the, the whole culture is great. I love the culture of emergency medicine and I love the culture of pediatrics and this kind of combines the best of both. Um, going through the specialties in school, I found each one had their own culture and parts of it I always liked and parts of it I always disliked and I just found that the willingness to learn, the compassion of the pedi pediatricians, the, the eagerness and the nobility of Emerge all kind of combined really well into that Peds Emerge piece for me and, and it keeps things fresh and it keeps things interesting and it, I, I have a different day every time I go into shift and, and that's something I absolutely love about my job. Mm -hmm. And what are some challenges with working with that pediatric population? So some of the challenges are some of the things that I love. Sometimes it's emotionally exhausting dealing with kids. Um, whether it's the two-year-old who just won't stop crying because he's sick, whether it's an emotionally exhausting conversation that you have to have with a parent about your child is a new diabetic or a new leukemia patient. Um, so it can be emotionally exhausting at times. We have a really great support system set up at work for when we're feeling that. Um, I'd say that's probably the biggest challenge of my job, you know, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, sometimes the shift work can also be exhausting. So I work the nights and evenings and weekends and holidays. I don't work all of them. We have a big enough group of PAs that we trade amongst ourselves, but you know, I'm not doing family medicine where I have a nine to five job. I knew that coming in to the job. Um, it was kind of a compromise that I was willing to take in order to do Emerge because I fell in love with it. Um, but, but it's exhausting and I can see myself moving at some point in the distant, distant future into something more nine to five. Mm -hmm. So can you describe um, a typical shift, for example? How many patients would you see? Where would you float around? Right. Um, so our typical shift, we do eight hour shifts. Um, 
and we try to stay our, as best as we can in one section of the emergency department when we are there. Obviously, if need dictates, we will flow ourselves from one area to the other area, but we, we try to stay in one part of the department. Typically, I try to see between three, about three patients per hour that I'm there. It can vary a lot. So on days where everybody's having cough and there's a terrible stomach flu going through the daycare, um, I might be able to see some extra patients because I know that there's a terrible stomach flu going through the daycare, a patient's very classical for it, they're not dehydrated, and we can do some counseling with the parents. Some days it's obviously a lot slower. So when we have those complex patients come in, when we have a sickle cell patient come in and they're having chest pain or they're having neurologic symptoms and we're starting to worry about a stroke or other more complicated problems, that can obviously slow down how we're flowing through patients. I, I would say on average I'm trying to see around 15 and 16 patients an hour in my eight hour shift. We, we aim for three, but it usually ends up being 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. And how many shifts are you doing a week? Um, on average, I do four shifts a week. Yeah. Some, some weeks, because we do shift work, um, I'll work three shifts. Some I will work five, but on average, it evens out to about four. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, what can a supervising MD expect from working with a PA in PZR? A supervising MD should hopefully expect that a PA eases their cognitive load, helps clear some of those patients, and really helps with the flow of the department. So can I, can I help manage some of these lower acuity patients um, and then have the doc come in so that I shift them to focusing on those more acutely ill patients? Um, I would also help hope that the doc can trust me to do a little bit of teaching and help with the residents, help with the fellows, not necessarily reviewing, but doing some of those procedural things that, because I'm there a lot and well, we're in a big teaching hospital, we have lots of residents and clerks and fellows come and go, um, but the PAs are a constant. So I would hope that they would also let me in, be involved in some teaching and pass on some of my knowledge procedurally and experientially that I have to the learners that come in. Mm -hmm. And how do you interact with the nursing staff uh, in the department? I love our nursing staff. We, we have the best nurses. Again, I, I'm biased, but, but our nurses are always on the ball. They're fantastic. If one of our nurses say that they are worried about a patient, I'm worried about a patient as well. Um, we have a great relationship. Um, we teach each other back and forth. There's always something new to learn from them. I hope that they learn from me and take things away as well. Um, yeah, our, our nursing staff is great. I've never had an issue or a conflict with our with our nurses. The PA role is the PA role is still quite new here in Canada. Mm -hmm. Do you often get asked what is a PA and what do you usually say in response? All the time. So, so all the time I get asked what a PA is. Um, so much so that in our electronic medical record, I actually have a little shorthand, like a little saved copy and paste that I put into the end of charts because um, it's asked. I usually tell people that PAs are healthcare professionals. We trained under a medical model. We help by working as a team with a supervising physician. We still see patients. We can start investigations. We can do blood work. We can do procedures and or prescribe medications if needed. Um, but we do so working in a team with a doctor. So when people hear that we're part of that healthcare team, they're usually really reassured by the role of PAs, and I've never actually had a negative experience where I've had a patient refuse to see a PA. I, I think, for the most part, they are happy that they're being seen quicker than they might have been otherwise if they had to wait. If there are any PA students interested in pursuing a career or an elective in PCR, what tips or advice would you give them? Um, we love clerk students, so keep, keep sick kids in mind for a clerkship. Um, I would say that the most important part of being in Peds Emerge is really that interactive with kids skills. I can teach anybody pediatric medicine. Like pediatric medicine is memorization, it's algorithms, it's learning the art, but interacting with a child who's panicked um, is something totally different. So getting, getting into that role where you're able to interact with kids where you're used to working with them, that's, that's super important for what we do. 
are you involved in a lot of teaching or precepting of medical learning or of PA <coughs> students? So whenever a PA student comes into the department, I try to introduce myself, try to get hands-on. If I see something interesting, I pull them aside um, and try to get them involved as much as I can. I also do a little bit of facilitating at U of T um, in their PA school. So whenever I see one of my students, I obviously introduce myself and I, I like to check in on them as well. Um, we have a great team of teachers, so sometimes I'm not, not their primary kind of preceptor but checking in on them, making sure that they're getting the best out of their experience and pulling them aside when there's something unique or hands-on that they can only learn at sick kids is something I try to do. And what is it that draws you to mentoring and teaching? I don't know, I, I just, I really, I really enjoy teaching. I think it's so cool that I learned this skill. I think I'm helping people and I want to help other people learn this skill so that they can help people. I don't know if there's anything in particular that draws me to it. My, my parents are both in healthcare, but they've both been in education roles in healthcare. Um, maybe I got it from them. Uh, I, I've just, I find it very uh, rewarding. I find it rewarding work. Mm -hmm. And can you speak to some of the sessions that you've taught or workshops that you've uh, facilitated recently? <laughs> Recently, um, so we just did the point of care ultrasound workshop at the CAPA 2019 conference. I've heard good things so far in terms of reviews. Um, it was an amazing team effort again. I had PAs come from sick kids. I had PA students get involved. I had ultrasound fellows and ultrasound staff get involved. So it was a, it was a big group effort. Um, I also have my brother, he's a nursing student, get involved. I have to shout out to him. Um, yeah, I think the workshop went very well. I, I'm happy that I was able to teach somebody a hands-on skill that I use every single day that I think changes how I manage probably half of my patients um, and I think is ultimately better for patients than some of the more traditional modalities. Can you speak to POCUS? Like what is it and um, why is it making such a big impact on your practice? So POCUS is point of care ultrasound. It's ultrasound that's performed at the bedside by a non-radiologist. We use it a lot in the pediatric eMERGE, both because we want to save kids radiation. So if that means I can save them a chest x-ray, that would be fantastic. Um, it also helps with our cognitive offloading. So if I put the probe, the ultrasound probe, onto a child and I see a pneumonia, I don't need to worry about why they're short of breath anymore. I see the issue and I can focus my attention to treating instead of solving a mystery. Um, lastly, it helps with our patient flow. Sometimes to get a patient to go outside the department is either not safe because they're unstable or it just takes a long time and, and they're stuck in the ultrasound, ultrasound department or the x-ray department for however long because they're also overworked and backed up, so it might be half hour, 45 minutes that they're gone um, on a bad day. And to be able to help that patient faster and by virtue of helping them faster, help the patients in the waiting room faster as well, that's, that's super beneficial to us. And that's great, that's a skill that PAs can, uh, can take on. Mm -hmm. So how do you get competent or where can PAs learn focus? So there's a couple different ways. So I'm really fortunate because the hospital I work at has an ultrasound fellowship and they've allowed me to tag on, not as an official fellow, but they're all amazing at teaching and they've let me tag on to their rounds and their teaching lectures and their bedside rounds. So they've really been fantastic for me. And then we have some formal modules in place in order to ensure that we're competent. And we have some online evaluations that are our, all of our scans get reviewed by an expert to ensure that they're meeting standard. Um, other ways that PAs can get competent in ultrasound, so the Scarborough General Hospital, their, their M-Wave POCUS team actually has a ultrasound fellowship available for PAs, so PAs that are practicing are welcome to apply to that fellowship, um, and that's one way that they can get competent in emergency medicine ultrasound. There's also lots of courses that are available outside. Um, there's the U-STAR course at Sunnybrook Hospital. 
Um, there's a couple of courses. I think there's some courses through the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians that PAs are eligible to take. So it really depends on where you're working and what exactly you want to do with this skill. How do you stay on top of like current, um, current treatment and management of uh, pediatric issues in the ER? I love podcasts. I, I'm a podcast addict. I think I have probably, tw not 20, probably at least a dozen podcasts on my phone. Um, I, I walk to work, so during my half hour walk, I'm listening to a podcast. I also signed up for some emails where I get relevant journal articles delivered to my in basket. Um, we also have rounds at the hospital. So we have both journal rounds as well as teaching rounds. So one of the fellows or the staff will teach and the PAs are welcome to attend that as well as to attend the journal rounds where an important article is sent out by a supervising physician and then together with a group we'll discuss kind of some of the highs and lows of that article and how it's relevant to our practice. And um, are you involved in any kind of research or uh, any other professional development outside of, um, mm. outside of uh, your clinical practice? I am. So I think all the PAs at SickKids are involved in research. So we're also a big research hospital, um, besides being a teaching hospital. PAs at SickKids are involved in seeing if having a PA call a patient back after the eMERGE visit to do a check-in and do some further education can help to prevent some return emergency visits by giving patients that reassurance and also providing them at-home management skills. Um, I'm involved with some research involving ultrasound in kids and how we can best use that to assess for increased intracranial pressure. Um, so I'm doing that as kind of a research assistant where I'm on call and I go in and if there's a child who's eligible for the study, I'll do, do an ultrasound on them. Um, I'm also doing my Master of Public Health right now at U of T. So through the School of Public Health there, I'm able to do some research and I'm really trying to focus on PA education and what's the best way to teach PAs so that they retain the knowledge and can easily incorporate it into their practice. So Masters of Public Health with a focus on with a and medical education. The official title is Masters of Public Health, Family and Community Medicine with a co-specialization in resuscitation and trauma. Um, really what that means is I am focusing on medical education um, and I'm trying to do it through the lens of that more emergent perspective. And what are you hoping to do with your MPH? I'm hoping to teach. So I'm hoping to get into the universities and be able to teach PA students to the best of my ability so that they become the best of PAs of their abilities. How do you see your, your practice changing over the years? Hopefully I see a continuation of the trust I've developed with my supervising physicians continue to grow, whether that means increasing scope or whether that means um, seeing a wider breadth of patients. Um, that's kind of how I would like my next few years at Sick Kids to go. I'd also love to be involved in more of their teaching aspects and some of their research aspects. I find that fascinating. Um, obviously, since I'm doing my master's in medical education, I obviously find that fascinating, but I would love to be more involved in that, and that's kind of the route I'm hoping to go in my future career. Mm -hmm. And um, if you were involved in the process of hiring a, another PA for the PCR, mm -hmm. what are some attributes or what are some um, what are some things that would look that you would look for in a candidate that would be a good fit for the position? We would look first and foremostly, first and foremostly, for their ability to interact with kids. Um, again, I can teach the medicine part, that's okay, um, but it's really hard to teach that interactive skill with kids. I would look for somebody who is ambitious um, and eager to learn because emergency medicine, and particularly pediatric emergency medicine where everything is very new um, and evolving, it, it's very much on the front line and cutting edge, so I would want somebody who's able and willing to keep up with that research as well. Um, I look for somebody who's eager to push the limits of being a PA. I want somebody who is willing to do those extra things like get involved in research and teach and I, I love that in an applicant. I think that shows real drive and ambition not only for their clinical practice but for what it means to be a PA. Are you happy with your decision to become a PA? I love it. I never had a doubt after the first day of PA school. I love that I get to be hands-on with patients and be on the front lines. I love that I get to work in this amazing team with my supervising physicians and the nurses. I love that I get to work with kids all day. Um, I think that's amazing. 
yeah, I've never regretted my decision to become a PA. And what would you say to people that are unsure or they're sort of struggling between PA and MD? Do you have any tips or advice? If possible, try to shadow a PA. It really helps cement that I want to become a PA. I know sometimes we're, we're a little hard to find or not able to take students, but if you can, shadow a PA to really understand the role, I think that's invaluable. And same with the doctor, like get out there, live a day in the life, see what it's like, um, understand the roles, the responsibilities that come with it, and take, take your time in the decision. It's a, it's a big decision to make, but make sure you're understanding what you're doing. I've done a bunch of talks that for high school students and for undergraduate students, um, active on social media, answering some questions there about the role of PAs. So I think that, again, the public education part is important, not just for the PA profession, but to, to help individuals kind of learn what a PA is and learn that it's an option, because a lot of people don't know it's an option, even though PAs in Canada have been around for 12 years now? 12? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and would you say that it's a, a growing profession? Defin definitely a growing profession. So I mean, every year U of T graduates close to 30 patients, uh, 30 patients. 30. U of T graduates close to 30 PAs. Uh, McMaster graduates just under that. And the military will also have some PAs retire from active duty into the civilian side. Um, it's definitely a growing profession. And as more and more residents are starting to do their education with PAs in Canada, the need and the demand for PAs, I think, is going to grow with that. And even in pediatrics, because everybody comes through sick kids, we've seen that in the community, people are starting to get more and more interested in PAs in the community outside of the hospital setting. Awesome. So those were all my questions. Any final notes? Being a PA is awesome. I, I love every minute. Kids are amazing. People should get their flu shot. People should get their flu shot. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think I have anything else to say. <laughs>